Good morning, YouTube. My name is Justin. I run this channel here called Bike and Bird. And uh, before I was a self-loathing YouTuber, I was actually an insurance salesperson. So opposed to most of the videos on this channel, uh, today I'm actually gonna know what we are talking about. And that's going to be all the things that you need to know about motorcycle insurance. Let's get into it. <laughs> Now, I know that insurance is not exactly the most exciting topic by any means, but it is something that you should at least have a general knowledge about. So I'm going to make this video as detailed, but yet as entertaining as possible. It'll be chock full of video clips as well as some uh, self-deprecating humor. But before we get into it, I do want to say that every single state within this great country of the United States is going to be different. Every state's gonna have different laws. Not that but every company is going to have different ways that they do things a lot of people think that insurance companies are these big government overseen organizations that have to follow strict rules it's really not like that they actually are just a business the only thing that the government kind of steps in on in most states is that they require you to have it but outside of that it's pretty much up to the company to decide how they want to do business so I will be saying depending on the company and depending on the state a lot but anyways, let's jump right into it. So if you're looking at your own insurance policy or maybe if you're shopping around, there's gonna be three to four main categories, which is going to be liability, comprehensive, collision, and then other. But what do those words mean, Justin? Don't worry, I'm gonna go over it. So let's just go ahead and work our way down the list. Section one, liability. Now liability is that coverage that most likely your state is going to require you to have to drive on public roads. Reason being is that liability covers you in case you do damage to somebody else. Let's take this clip for example. Covering addict, Donna, you don't know. Oh. Oh. <laughs> now the gentleman on the black bike clearly was at fault to the gentleman on the white bike, albeit he is much better looking and definitely a more talented rider than the guy on the white bike. But Liability insurance is what's going to cover the black bike gentleman to pay for the damage on the white bike. Basically, this is going to cover you if you are liable for the accident, hence liability. Now, like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, this is going to vary pretty, I wouldn't say greatly, but it does vary from state to state. But when you see liability coverage, it's usually broken up into three different numbers. Now I'm gonna use Texas for an example because it's a better state than wherever you live. And uh, the limits are 30, 60, 25. Basically, this is saying that the state of Texas requires you to have this much coverage. But let's go over what those three numbers mean. So let me go ahead and uh, make myself smaller. No, no, not that small, not that small. All right, that's better. All right, that's better. All right, so 30 slash 60 slash 25. You'll probably see three numbers on your policy under the liability. Now, it doesn't matter what these numbers are, the order that they are in determines what they cover on the policy. The first two numbers are going to be for bodily injury, and the last number is going to be for property damage. The first number within the bodily injury category is how many dollars in thousands that the policy is gonna cover for one person. The second number is going to be the number Number of bodily injury claims for the entire accident. And then that third number is just the overall property damage. So now we know what those numbers mean, let's go ahead and put it into a example. Let's say that this lizard is a SUV, okay? And this bottle of uh, Geritol is you on your geezer glide. Say for example, you, I don't know, cut them off or do something to cause this SUV to have an accident. Now within the SUV, there was two passengers. We'll, be, we'll represent those passengers with these challenge coins. Now let's say that the driver had $10,000 worth of injuries and the passenger also had $10,000 worth of injuries. If you had the 30, 60, 25 coverage, you would still be fine. You have 10 on this side, which is below the 30 for the individual. You have 10 on this side, which is below the 30 for the individual. Add them together, you get 20,000, which is under the 60,000 for the combined accident. And say, for example, their SUV had another $10,000 for the damage, that falls below the 25,000 of the limit. So once again, you're still okay. 
Now let's switch it up a bit. Let's say this uh, Beetle here is another SUV, but this time we have three individuals in it. All right, same accident occurs. I, I don't, something happens, you get in an accident. All right, now we have three people involved in that accident. I'm gonna split this up into two different ways to show how you could not be covered within this accident. Example A, you've got $25,000 worth of damage on person one, another $25,000 worth of damage on person two, and another $25,000 worth of damage on person three. All three of these are under that $30,000 per person mark, correct? But when you add them all together, you now have a $75,000 combined bodily injury bill, which is now over that 60,000 combined limit that you have on your policy, which means you're about $15,000 in the hole. So what do you do when that happens? Basically, you're gonna get sued for that extra $15,000 and there's nothing that your insurance is gonna do for it. Now, the uh, second example, say for example, uh, person one has $40,000 worth of damage, person two has 10,000, and person three has 10,000. Altogether, you're at that $60,000 cap. You're, you'll be fine on that, but remember, person one has over $30,000, so anything over that $30,000 is once again not going to be covered by your insurance policy. Chances are you're gonna get sued for that extra 10,000. Now, I'm not doing this to, uh, to scare you by any means, but I don't know about you, I don't wanna be sued for $10,000, nor do I wanna be sued for a dollar. The reason I'm letting you know about all this is because when you're looking at liability insurance, carrying the state minimums on a motorcycle, you're probably gonna be okay. Chances are you're not gonna be causing more than that amount of damage on a vehicle unless you total it and people have some serious injuries. But there's always that worst case scenario. Say for example, you cut off a Maserati, that car goes on the guardrail, they're gonna charge $25,000 just for the paint job and everyone on the inside is injured to the point where they rack up you know an eight thousand dollar hospital bill it happens guys one thing i would suggest that you do when you are shopping for insurance is ask the representative how much extra is it going to be if i bump up to the next level like a 50 150 coverage chances are you're going to be looking at maybe a couple dollars a month essentially what i'm saying is that the liability coverage is pretty cheap so an extra couple dollars here and there might be worth it if God forbid you ever have to use it. All right, so that's gonna do it for section one. Hopefully uh, you were able to follow along with my perfect awesome examples. Section number two is going to be comprehensive. Now both comprehensive and collision are both kind of within the same category and they're also often referred to as full coverage. When you work in the industry, you learn to never use the term full coverage because it's not really true. Although yes, these coverages do provide you some sort of protection if you are not at fault or if something not riding related happens, but there's a lot of things built in the policy called exclusions that are not going to be covered under your policy. And I'll go over a few common exclusions after I explain what the coverages are. So back to the main topic, which is the comprehensive coverage. This is basically going to cover your bike for anything that happens to it during a non-riding event. Say for example, your uh, bike is parked out in a parking lot and a hailstorm hits. Dents it all to hell. That's where comprehensive comes in. Say you're at uh, Daytona Bike Week and you walk out of a bar after having just one drink and your bike is gone. That's where comprehensive comes in. Pretty simple stuff, right? Now moving on to section three, which is going to be the collision. Now collision can be anything riding related that happened to your motorcycle. Remember that clip from the beginning of the video where that super handsome Dyna rider ran into the back of that uh, ugly white street glide? No, no. Oh. <laughs> now thankfully there was no damage to that beautiful black Dyna, but if there was, collision coverage would have been what stepped in to repair that damage. Other instances, if you drop the bike and it becomes damaged enough to where you have to make a claim, that's where collision comes in. Now, I'm, I'm saying that kind of with a, you know, air quote here, because depending on 
what your claims provider is going to say if that was a moving violation or not. That dropping a bike might fall under comprehensive or it might fall under collision. Doesn't really matter. They both usually are going to have the same deductible, which we'll go over that in a second, and are gonna provide the same coverage for your bike. But other instances of collision coverages, is say for example, you're going around a corner and you low side or you high side out of it, just a complete freak accident, and your bike is you know dented and needs paint and everything, that's where collision comes in. Now one thing that I want to touch on and highlight, and I haven't done it in the first three sections because it doesn't really fall into any section for all companies, every company tends to label it differently and put it within different sections. And that's going to be your uninsured, underinsured motorist coverage. Now, this is essentially liability coverage that you are buying for yourself. Meaning that if you get hit by a driver who is uninsured or underinsured, say for example, a driver hits you and they only have a $25,000 property damage and they totaled out your brand new CVO road glide chances are there's gonna be a gap between that 25,000 and whatever that bike is worth at that time. At that point, sometimes your collision coverage will step in, sometimes your comprehensive will step in, but more cases than not, your uninsured, underinsured motorist coverage is gonna step in. Once again, this is a fairly cheap coverage. You're only talking about maybe, I'm not even gonna throw out quotes because it's gonna vary so much, a very small amount in comparison to the total coverage amount to basically provide you with a whole nother policy to cover yourself, not only yourself as in your bike, but yourself as in your body itself. Say for example, if you got hit by someone who had zero insurance, and you had a $10,000 hospital bill, I don't know about you, but I can't come up with $10,000 out of thin air. That coverage will definitely pay for itself if, once again, God forbid, you ever have to use it even once. Now, going back to something I briefly touched on earlier, and that is the deductible. Now, before working in the insurance industry, I had no idea what a deductible was, and I'm assuming you might not either. And it's pretty simple. It's essentially the amount that is deducted from your quote to get your bike fixed or repaired. For simple math, if you have a $1,000 deductible, which is way too high, and you get a quote for $10,000 to fix your bike, your insurance company is going to give you a check for $9,000. $10,000 minus the $1,000 deductible. My suggestion to you is make your deductible only as high as an amount that you can afford to spend at any given time. If you have $1,000 that you can just drop at the drop of a hat, by all means, carry a thousand dollars coverage. But I don't know about you, I don't, I don't like living like that. So I keep my deductibles as low as possible. Reason being is that if my bike goes down or gets damaged, I want to be able to get it fixed as soon as possible. I would hope that most of you guys are on the same page. But one final note on the deductible is that the difference between a thousand dollar deductible and a two hundred fifty dollar deductible is usually not that much this is definitely when you're looking for insurance this is definitely something i would suggest you get price options for all your deductible ranges and that way you can make a better understanding to know if it's going to be worth the extra couple dollars a month or not also ask whatever company you're quoting with if they offer a vanishing deductible. I am currently with Progressive uh, and they do offer the vanishing deductible. So that basically means every six months, is it's either six months or a year that you go without an accident, your deductible drops down either $100 or to the next tier, whatever they offer, which is pretty awesome and it's definitely worth the, uh, the extra money if they are charging for that option. Like I said, you use it once, it's gonna pay for itself. All right, so before we get into the uh, section four, which is basically just a catch-all, I wanted to go over some exclusions that I mentioned earlier in the video to kind of give you an understanding of what can happen to your bike and your insurance goes, yeah, we're not covering that. All right, so let's go ahead and start with property damage. This is gonna kind of cover both collision and comprehensive. Coverage will not apply for a loss if being used to carry persons or property for compensation or a fee. If you're delivering pizzas on your bike and for some reason you go down and they find out that uh, you were working while that happened, not covered. Uh, will not be covered or sustained during practice or preparation for any pre-range organized racing, stunting, speed or demolition contact, contest or activity or any riding activity conducted on a permanent or temporary racetrack, race course or during any closed course event. If you take your bike down the drag strip and you uh, get sideways in third gear and dump it, not gonna be covered. 
So this is a good one. Damage won't be covered on any vehicle caused by an intentional act committed by or at the direction of you or a relative. So if you dent it on purpose, it's not gonna be covered. This is, this is my favorite. This is one that a lot of people are not aware of. Due to destruction or confiscation by government or civil authorities of any vehicle because you or any relative engaged in illegal activities. If your bike gets impounded and uh, the cops, you know, dick it all up during the impound. Mm -hmm. Not covered. This is my, my other favorite one. Uh, to any vehicle, coverage will not be provided to any vehicle caused directly or indirectly by war, declared or undeclared, or civil war, warlike action by any military force of any government, sovereign, or other authority using military personnel or agents. This includes any actions taken to hinder or defend against an actual or expected attack, or any action taken by a governmental authority to hinder or defend against any of these acts. So basically, if uh, a war breaks out, or even something as small as a riot to where the National Guard is deployed, and they, you know, plow a tank through your garage, you're, you're SOL. Which is really sad when you think about, you know, when you're watching, uh, I remember the Baltimore riots were the most recent ones, and you see people, you know, flipping cars or burning down houses or buildings, chances are those people didn't get a dime from their insurance company. Here's another good one. Um, coverage won't be provided to any vehicle caused directly or indirectly by any accidental or intentional discharge, dispersal, or release of radioactive, nuclear, pathogenic, or poisonous biological material. So don't put nuclear waste on your bike. And this list goes on for literally pages and pages. I highly suggest you go and uh, download. That's on your policy docs. That's that big thick pack you get in the mail as soon as you start a policy. Uh, that is the kind of stuff that's in there. So just go to the exclusion, the exclusions section. I trust me, it's it'll be entertaining if nothing else. If you find a, a good one that I didn't read off, go ahead and put that down in the comments. I'd love to see what your your insurance labels as an exclusion. And now onto section four, which is basically going to be a catch-all for everything, either motorcycle related or just an additional coverage that you can tag onto your insurance that you either might not know about or might need a little bit more information on. And the first coverage I'm gonna reference is trip interruption. Now, this isn't necessarily motorcycle specific. I will say that I see it more on motorcycle policies than say, for example, auto policies, but this is basically exactly what it says. If for some reason you get an accident uh, on a trip, obviously it's going to cost money to get back to where you live, or at least get to somewhere where you can stay or provide accommodations of some sort. Say for example, you ride from Arkansas down to Florida and your bike gets stolen. You don't have a way to get back. That is where a trip interruption could step in to help you out. Now I will say that I've quoted a few different companies and their trip interruption does work quite differently. So some things you're gonna check for is a dollar limit per day. Some companies have a very low $25 per day limit, basically just getting you food. Uh, and some companies have an exuberant, you know, $500 a day. It's gonna pay for lodging and everything else. This is also usually tied in with roadside assistance, which is another coverage within this catch-all. Once again, do your research, ask your representative of how the roadside assistance works. Sometimes they'll just cover up to a flat dollar amount. Say for example, you have $100 for a tow truck and that's it. Some companies will say, we will pick up your bike and tow it to X miles from where the bike is picked up, completely free of charge. Like I said, every company does it differently and I'm more than confident that your rep will know what they're talking about and exactly what you're asking for when it comes to the roadside assistance coverage. Also, with both the roadside assistance and the trip interruption, it's usually extremely cheap. I'm talking less than a dollar per month. If I was telling you to get any sort of coverage, get that coverage. It's a lot more likely that you're going to break down the side of the road than it is that you're going to total the bike. Chances are that tow truck's gonna cost you about 100, 200 bucks. You'd have to have that roadside assistant coverage on your policy for about 12 to 15 years and not use it to be in the red. You use it once, it pays for itself. Next up on my list is rental car coverage. Once again, 
not motorcycle specific by any means. I see this on a lot of auto policies. It's definitely not the cheapest option. It doesn't fall within that, uh, you know, trip interruption and roadside assistance cheapness, but it is still fairly cheap. If you're someone who only has a motorcycle for your only means of transportation, by all means, definitely spend the extra money and get yourself some rental coverage. But once again, every company's going to do it differently. Most companies are gonna offer different options as well. Most of the time it's on a dollar per day basis. For example, $25 a day for X days to pay for a rental. So maybe do a little bit of research on how much rental cars cost in your area, what kind of car that you would need to get around in. Uh, if you're riding a motorcycle daily, it's probably not gonna be <laughs> Probably not gonna be a, a super luxurious vehicle by any means. But say for example, if your bike's in the shop for 30 days, 30 days at $25 a day, you're looking at 750 bucks. That in my mind is worth it. Next up on the list is carried contents. Now this is a coverage that is very misunderstood across all auto products, specifically cars. Now, a lot of auto policies, speaking to cars, trucks, etc., are not going to offer this coverage standard. Some might offer it as a add-on, but it's definitely not included in any policy I have ever seen. I'm gonna use a car for this example because I feel like a lot of people are going to be surprised by this. Say for example, you park your car in the uh, Walmart parking lot. Someone smashes your window and steals your cell phone out of there. Cell phone's probably about $1,000. Your insurance company is gonna pay you zero cents for that cell phone. Now the broken window is gonna be covered by uh, your comprehensive coverage, but anything inside the vehicle is not covered. You can think of your vehicle, whether it be motorcycle or car, as a, uh, a toy car or a toy motorcycle, okay? All right, so take your car, your motorcycle, flip it upside down, and shake the shit out of it. You know, you're gonna lose. Change, maybe your backpack, laptops, cell phones, maybe a GPS here or there. Everything that fell out of that vehicle, not covered. So anything that you have in your saddlebags, anything that you have in tank bags or any sort of storage within the vehicle, or even, for example, your luggage, not covered. Basically anything that is not bolted to the vehicle is not going to be covered by your comprehensive or collision coverages. So if someone cracks open your saddlebag and steals everything that you have in there, once again, the company's gonna pay for the damage to your saddlebag if they did damage it, but everything that was in it, not covered. But the carried content coverage does cover that. Say for example, someone goes by and yanks your luggage off the your, your sissy bar. Now that is covered. So I guess this coverage is really gonna depend on how much stuff do you keep on your bike? How often is it um, exposed to being messed with, being vandalized or stolen or anything like that? Also, this doesn't apply to just vandalism, vandalism or theft. Say for example, if you have a $3,000 MacBook in your saddlebag and you low side and that laptop is toast, that's not gonna be covered by your motorcycle policy. It will be covered by the carried contents policy or carried contents coverage within your policy. So like I said, that's kind of a 50-50, uh, depends on if you ever carry anything that is worth value uh, that can be stolen or broken. I feel like this is gonna be that one coverage that kind of splits people down the middle. Evaluate on your own. And last but certainly not least, it's uh, my favorite coverage, which is the accessory coverage. Now everyone knows that I am the bolt-on king, which means that I have a lot of accessories on my bike. Now I'm sure if you've got anything bolted on your bike, you understand that that stuff adds up over time. But I don't think you understand how quickly that stuff adds up and how high that total actually gets. Now I will say that most policies do include a base accessory coverage. I would suggest that you ask your insurance rep about what that covers and what the limit is. And that's really where you're gonna to have to do your due diligence to add up all the accessories on your bike, get a dollar amount for them, and then see if you fall under that limit or if you need to bump up that coverage a little bit. Once again, this coverage is not that expensive. You're probably only looking at maybe 10 to 50 cents per thousand dollars of coverage per month. Super cheap, definitely worth it. And that's gonna cover it for everything, whether it be a collision or a comprehensive um, damage to that part or accessory. Or say for example, I mean, you see those seat locks popping up on uh, websites now. If someone yanks your $700 seat and you only have $500 worth of accessory coverage, you're, you're kind of SOL because that, that, uh, that seat was not part of the bike when it first, you know, 
came from the factory. And that's also one thing that you should clarify with your um, insurance company. Some, some companies will go off of how the bike was bought. Some companies will go off of how the bike was shipped from the factory. I will say most go off of what was shipped from the factory. So if you get, say for example, you have a $7 seat, they're going to replace it with whatever it came from the factory, which is gonna be about 100, 200 bucks. You're still gonna be out about $500. But if you have that accessory coverage, that might uh, be able to supplement that extra $500. So that is going to do it for the coverages. Now I know you're asking yourself, why, who, who should I go with for insurance? And I'm just going to say, shop around, shop around, and uh, oh yeah, shop around. Seriously, don't waste your time asking your buddies, hey, what do you got? Don't waste your time going on some forum or hdforums.com or Facebook or anything and, and ask what people are using and what they're paying. It doesn't freaking matter. I could have an identical twin living across the street with the same driving record, the same exact bike, and his quote is going to be different than mine. Seriously guys, there are so many factors that go into building a pricing model for each individual company. What I suggest you doing is writing down what coverages you want, what options you want to explore, for example, the different deductible options, things like that, what coverages you want, and then block off an hour to two hours and call these companies. Don't do online quotes. Reason being is that discounts are going to play a lot more into your favor if you're on the phone than if you are online. The people on the phone are licensed representatives. They are trained within that company to give you literally the best price possible. Because when you call those people, they want your business. They want to get that quote down as low as possible to get you to join their company. So they're gonna give you every single discount they can. So like I said, block off about two hours, call these companies, give them your VIN number, give them what coverages you want and see what they can do price-wise. Some that I would recommend, not saying that you have to go with these or even start with these, Progressive and Dairyland. Dairyland is a pretty much motorcycle exclusive insurance company. Uh, and then Progressive is probably the biggest big name motorcycle insurance company out there. If you get a policy through Harley Davidson, it's going through Progressive. If you get a policy through USAA, it's going through Progressive. So like I said, weigh your options, know what you're getting. And if you have any questions, if I didn't cover anything specifically, go ahead and leave a comment down in the comment section. I will answer that as soon as I possibly can. If you found this video helpful in any way, shape, or form, please do me a favor and hit that like button. It does do a ton for the channel. It only takes you two seconds. Come on, don't be lazy. Do it for me. And if you haven't already, go ahead and punch that subscribe button. Come on. I know you want to. Anyways, guys, that's going to do it for today's video. If you like this video, go ahead and hit that like button. If you haven't already, go ahead and punch that subscribe button. Again, if you already just did it. And as always, thank you for watching. I'll see you guys next time.